I'm Dr. Daniel Cross-Turner, and I'm head of programming and outreach for the Georgetown County Library System. And welcome to the library series of online programs celebrating South Carolina's deep and diverse food traditions, and it's called From Blue Hills to Green Sea, Representing South Carolina Foodways. Uh, so we'll have a range of scholars taking us on a culinary adventure, looking into eating traditions, food growing traditions, and uh, food preparation traditions from the upcountry or Piedmont area in the shadow of the, the Blue Ridge Mountains, all the way down to this area, the coastal plain um, and the low country. Uh, so we'll canvas the state here. Um, these programs are generously sponsored by South Carolina Humanities, as well as our friends of the Waccamaw Library and friends of the Georgetown Library. So we're grateful uh, to all, all those organizations for their, their support. Okay, and today uh, we have uh, a wonderful uh, treasure uh, from uh, right above us in, in Horry County. Um, Veronica Gerald is her name. And Veronica is a longtime board member for the South Carolina Academy of Authors. Uh, she is Distinguished Professor Emerita at Coastal Carolina University, where she served as founding director of the Charles Joyner Institute for Gullah and African Diaspora Studies. Veronica is a native of Mullen, South Carolina, and she is co-author of the Ultimate Gullah Cookbook from 2002, which offers historical notes on Gullah language, beliefs, and cultural practices alongside more than 100 recipes. So that's a great get if you don't already have it uh, to add to your, your cooking collection, the ultimate Gullah cookbook. Herself Gullah, Veronica Gerald has been honored by the South Carolina General Assembly with a Folk Heritage Award for her advocacy of Gullah culture. Her symposium contribution is entitled, All Shut Eye Ain't Sleep. Gullah Cooking and the South Carolina African Connection. And it will show us how after nearly 400 years, Gullah Foodways, based on the trinity of love, creativity, and the need to make do, represent a critical global connection between African and American cultures. So sit back and enjoy uh, a wonderful talk by Veronica Gerald. Good morning and welcome to my session of this virtual symposium from Blue Hills to Green Seas, sponsored by the Georgetown County Library. I'm especially excited about this particular symposium because it gives me an opportunity to talk about something near and dear to me, and that's Gullah food, Gullah cooking. I found this to be a, a, a subject of my passion when I realized as recent as 2001, 1999 to 2002, I realized that what was happening is that Gullah food was being called Southern food, low country cooking. This occurred to me one day as I was traveling back and forth between Conway, Myrtle Beach to St. Helena Island during the time that I had taken a leave of absence from Coastal Carolina University and um, took the position of Director of History and Culture at Penn Center. I, checking back and forth with my mom, I found out that I was prone to stop and eat in restaurants along the way. On this one particular day, I stopped in a restaurant in CV, um, South Carolina, between Mount Pleasant and McClellanville. And eating the food, I just loved the taste. And then as I was sitting there, I watched endless amounts of people, African-American people coming out of the kitchen restocking the buffet, bus, busing tables, going up to the 
to front for whatever reason, taking breaks, it occurred to me that these are the cooks and therefore these are their food culture is supposed to make this food taste like this. Because I realized earlier, you may have a dollar person in your kitchen cooking and you may have rules about it. Like you may not want to add salt or you may not want to do this or you may not want to do that for the food. But as soon as you turn your back, that person is going to adjust and edit that food to relate to her or his taste buds. That's the way it works in cooking and in food culture. So that's when I decided that I would write, ending up co-authoring a book on Gullah cooking, just so that it would have a place in the conversation. At that time, the closest cookbook to it was a book that's still on the market, been on the market for years, and it's a very good cookbook called The Charleston Receipts. And to see that the ultimate Gullah cookbook on a bookshelf alongside of that book made me understand further that a lot of the recipes that we know as know as Gullah food they're in the Charleston Receipt Book, primarily because it was written during the time when cooks in the kitchen were largely uh, Gullah Geechee people. My talk today is called, All Should I Ain't Sleep. I called it that because one of the things that I realized early on is that Gullah people have like an affinity for sayings, proverbial sayings and those kinds of things. So you might have um, a big paragraph in one culture that talks about something. But with Gullah people, it's very simple to say, all should I ain't sleep. Careful now, all should I ain't sleep. And this, if you are Gullah or even Southern, you know or you've heard this before. It's kind of like a warning, a kind of cautionary tale. Remember, all eyes that are closed does not mean that the bearer of those eyes is asleep. Ears are always open, even when eyes appear to be shut. But what really brings this home for today's discussion is the fact that things may not always be what they seem to be. When you live as we do in a strong, tourism-driven market, there's a tendency for those in power to reach into your culture and pull out those things that they see to be exotic or flamboyant or something that would attract tourists. When I first um, began to pay closer attention to this tourism business and how it affected um, my culture, I began to look at the fact that on the brochures in the welcome centers, when they're talking about Carolina, they always had a sweet grass basket on it or talking about the presence of the Gullah Geechee people. So as people began to come in to South Carolina, they began to come in to know more about the Gullah Geechee people. Many of them wanted to know where they lived, where are they? Can they talk that language? Um, who are they? But when you look at the things that are presented on the outside to attract tourists, we also realize that things are missing. 
like in the case with the food. No one was doing that early part of um, my focus. No one was talking about food as it related to Gullah Geechee. What happened to bring all this together had to do with the out-migration, the diaspora, the movement of Africans out of Africa by force or by choice to various parts of the world. Everywhere, Africans were placed to be used as laborers to advance the cause of wealth. So in this out-migration, one thing that was not realized is that these people as they left Africa brought with them a memory. They also brought with them taste, a memory of taste, a memory of, of cooking, of doing things, of worshiping, there was this memory that traveled across the Atlantic Ocean along with them. By the time my people landed um, in the, what is now the, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, by the time that they landed in Charleston and were later sent out to plantations throughout the region, and by the time they landed on Brook Green Plantation in Georgetown County, they were already rice farmers. They already knew how to cultivate rice. So they helped the region grow and become prosperous. By the eve of the Civil War, just to make a point, Joshua John Ward, who was the owner of Brook Green Plantation, was one of the richest men in the world. The Africans who were on that plantation created variants and taught the world how to grow and cultivate and crop the, 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 the rice and just how to make it work. Later on, as you look into um, when it was named the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor and became a national heritage area, the world was beginning to see that not only was the Carolina colony a very big influence in the development of, the, of Europeans in America, it was a corridor that went all the way from just north of Wilmington, North Carolina, on down to St. Augustine, Florida, and 30 miles inland. Nearly half a million people or more live, Gullah Geechee people live in this region and have influenced and characterized the region in many ways, one of which is the food that we spoke about earlier. So if you remember that I said that these Africans brought with them taste buds and a memory of what used to be, and they brought it with them on American soil. When, once the taste and the memory came and settled in, there was a, uh, a monthly food ration that had to be dealt with. This adaptability of, of this food was also important during this time. When you look at the food ration on Brook Green Plantation in the 19th century, you had 10 quarts of rice, sometimes peas, sometimes both, but always rice. One bushel of sweet potatoes. It goes without saying that 
any Gullah Geechee household, any Gullah Geechee cook is going to go to this particular um, food item for any number of things. We have created ways for sweet potatoes that um, no one ever thought of. Because we have to remember that it were, there were African women, later African American women, who were the cooks in the kitchen, in the plantation economy. A lot of the plantation owners were not part of that gone with the wind, uh, super rich group of people. Many of them were struggling to become that way. So when these slave cooks began to bring in creativity and adaptability to the food, it also transferred itself to the master's kitchen. In addition to the sweet potatoes, they were given um, salt fish. Salt fish stayed in the culture way, way until the 60s, where people began to choose, uh, choose other ways of preserving fish. But pack, packing fish and salt was a common thing. And of course, the fish that was most often used had to do with the region that you lived in. So you may be living in a region where whiting and um, shark, small shark, or something of that nature, or you may be living down on the Grand Strand where you have a large Waccamaw River and the ocean and may have both um, freshwater fish and saltwater fish. One kind of molasses, we can see that in today's um, food ways because there's a kind of need to add a little sugar every now and then to certain things. And so this molasses became more or less a, a cooking item, more so than pancakes and syrup, which um, would not have been very advantageous to a slave community because what was needed is food that stuck to your stomach, as they say. So this one pan of molasses was probably used primarily for cooking. Two pounds of pork, again, that was seasoning meat, as it still remains um, seasoning meat in a lot of the dishes today. The reason why I'm assuming that this was not meat to be eaten in slices per serving is because it's not enough. Big families need to have dishes like soups and stews and meats, uh, dishes that were plentiful because the idea was to feed the whole family. Plus, they are coming out of an environment in Africa that did not necessarily um, put meat at the top of the food chain like we do here in this country. Um, and even here, it was seasoning and larger forms of meat were used for uh, major celebrations and that kind of thing. You were also given bacon and beef, beef in the summer, and then one peck of meal, one peck of grits. For those who are too young to remember peck, that's about two gallons. So this was the base, became the base, the on the ground base for Gullah cooking on American soil. They added the memory, they added the taste, and then added supplements to it from other ways. So let's start with saying that Gullah food culture was built around the monthly rations of the plantation and from memory and taste that they brought with them. Along with the food ration, slave um, cooks, husbands, the men, they would seek out wild game. That could be any way, any game from 
birds. There used to be a real popular bird stew that was made in my um, community when I grew up, but I don't remember. Um, and it's one of those dishes that kind of died out with the, the cooks that favored it. You also had homegrown vegetables. One of the great things about being on a rice plantation is that it was built around a task system. And in this task system, you were given a task for the day. If you were able to complete it early enough to go home and work in your garden or to go fishing or to go hunting, that was okay. Many uh, ex-slaves in the narratives tell that they would fin finish uh, early to help other people. Many finished early to go and do a kind of fishing for the community, what they call the streets, where all the slaves lived together and among each other. They were also allowed to have gardens. So the gardens allowed for the impact of like vegetables and various things that we hear of today, watermelon, collard greens, mustard greens. We also had peanuts and your root crops. There was a strong and is a strong belief in root crops like potatoes, peanuts, anything that grows turnip roots. That's what they even call them, um, that grows underground. That is an entirely different lecture and an entirely different cooking uh, process. They also lived what we call at the creek. Um, it was very common to hear someone say that people live out the creek, got to live out the creek. Today, it would, if it were used as frequently as it was back then, they would say something like, um, the pandemic has caused high times. Got to live out the creek. And this is um, what happened with Gullah food is in addition to the basic ration, these things were added. But most importantly, and I, I, I really have to another, I, I have to talk quickly about it today, but it's something that needs to be discussed further. Cooking in Gullah style requires taste. Because if you remember, it is the taste that reflects the memory that got brought to this country and passed down through the generations. One of the most unique things that I have to explain to people is the fact that you have, have to add love to food. Love is an organic quality that we all have. May not think so, but in the corridors, of the heart, whether it's hidden away, packed away, is an ability to love and to give love. Now, this is usually used when you talk about giving love to people, but you have to give love to everything that you do. Sometimes it's intangible, but it comes across, it comes out of you in a way that makes whatever it is that you're doing wonderful. So when you might ask a Gullah Geechee person, well, how was, the, how was the big dinner? Or was the food good or whatever? And they'll say, gal, that, that almond and sticky foot in it a putty foot in it. To us, that simply means that that was food was so good that the cook was successful in transferring love because that's what made, when you stick your foot in it, 
That meant you had to go throughout the entire body, gathering up all of your little love cells, if you will, and push it out into the food. So in summary, it's built around the rations that were guaranteed monthly rations on the plantation and anything else surrounding the plantation, hunting, fishing, shrimping, all of that is part of uh, the color food characteristics. One of the things that I wanted to say um, at some point in this talk is that a lot of the food that people have um, taken from this culture and disseminated across the world, like shrimp and grits, um, it's very expensive today, but the dish shrimp and grits, and it's really not shrimp and grits as they're talking about it in general, is stewed shrimp over grits. But one of the things about it is that dish more than any was a dish put together out of what we call a make do attitude. People say that when you make do, you can take anything and make food, anything and make a home, anything and make anything if you know how to make do. So the shrimp and grits uh, came out of a, a process of going fishing and not catching anything, but a few swimps, as we call it. Um, when you come home with just a few and your family is 12, members strong, you have to find a way to let everyone get some meat, but they must also get filled. And that's how the gravy comes in. You cut the shrimp up in tiny pieces and you cook it in gravy, stew it down in gravy and onions, and then you serve it over grits or serve it over a rice. That way everyone in the family gets a touch of the meat but the rice and our grits and gravy is really what made the recipe um, valuable in terms of feeding the family. So the next time you pay $35 for a dish like shrimp and grits, please know that it was not always looked upon as a prestigious gift uh, uh, food. It was looked upon as high time. Finally, I want to share with you the recipe, I mean, the, the dish that I chose for this presentation, simply because I have such a wonderful story that goes with it. It's not a beautiful dish, but it's called greens and cornmeal dumplings. This is a make-do dish where you may only have the vegetables in your garden and some cornmeal and flour, you could make a dish that's scrumptious. And why I wanted to use this one is because it, this dish was the first dish that teed me, cued me in on the connection between Gullah people and Africa people. I was in college with a roommate from Sudan. During the time when I went to school, schools were still segregated and um, even people coming to America to be educated had to go to schools um, based on their color. And Africans had to go to the historically black college or university. So this was the first time that many of us coming up from the South and coming from small towns met face to face with our African counterparts. My roommate um, at the time, they were having a coup in her country and she was told not to come home. So mother, my mother told me to bring her home with me um, and so that she wouldn't have to stay at the university for two weeks uh, alone. This was during the Christmas holiday and she did come. And my mother uh, for Sunday dinner cooked the most elaborate food as you do when company comes. And this was one of the dishes. And my roommate sobbed because she thought 
that my mother had made this dish, especially for her, because they made it in her hometown. The first time that I realized was when my mother said to her, no, we've been cooking this meal on Brook Green ever since I was a little girl. It's called greens and cornmeal dumplings. The light bulb went off. How did my Sudanese roommate recognize a South Carolina food weight, a South Carolina dish? Remember, we were both in school together, but we were in Maryland. And the eating culture up there was much different. So here we go. I'm looking at a dish that is definitely connected to Africa. And when I was in college, we wanted all things Africa. Black power, um, your know, African pride. We wanted all things Africa. And here I was and my mother eating a dish that had African origins. Now, when I went to Africa recently and I asked about it, it's not totally the same, but enough the same. Because remember, food is adaptive. Now, in this dish, there are three different types of greens here. You have um, collard greens, curly mustards, and turnips. Not the roots, even though you can put the roots in. You can even do this dish before. Whatever is in the garden, you just pluck the leaves, bring it in, chop it up, and make the dish. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, greens in the Gullah Geechee culture is always seasoned with that same pork meat that we learn to use when during the um, the food ration, that two pounds of pork, the memory of it, and the taste became the use of it. So in greens, it's very, very common to season your greens with ham hocks or some kind of pork. Now the world is moving away from that kind of uh, seasoning now and people are finding new ways to do it, but to keep the taste. But you always add onions and you, you, you cook the greens first. And when it's about 10 minutes from being done, that's when you're getting ready to add the cornmeal dumplings. Now we all know that dumplings do best steamy. So you start it a little bit, but then you steam it the rest of the way. Now, this particular recipe is on page 84 in the Ultimate Gullah Cookbook, but I also looked online and I found it online, but the lady does credit the Ultimate Gullah Cookbook for the source. And I was glad to see that because you can't necessarily um, prevent that kind of thing. And I wanna say too that these dumplings are a little stiff, but I did it so that it would um, become visible in the presentation, what they should look like or how the dish can look. But um, you start with, and I'll um, read you the ingredients here, real simple for the dumplings. Keeping in mind, I'm, I'm assuming that you already know how to make greens. So you take your, in this case, three types of greens, season it the way that you want it to be seasoned, turn it on and let it cook for, you know, you have to keep watching your food because remember you got to keep tasting it. Once that the greens start cooking, you want to taste the water just to make sure it has the kind of flavor that you want it to have. So as it cooks down, as they say, and you keep stirring so that the bottom of the greens become the top of the greens. You don't want 
the same greens to cook at the bottom of the pot the whole time because it will be too limp. So you keep stirring the greens and bringing the bottom to the top, bringing the bottom to the top of the, um, the pan until they're about 10 minutes before cooking. And then you start making your dumplings. Get a large bowl and blend together a cup of cornmeal. Now I cheat a little bit on this, but I used to have to hide it from my mother. I do about two thirds cup of cornmeal and one third of jiffy mix. I like jiffy because it has a little sweetness to it. So the dumplings have a little taste, but um, you have to keep it a secret because a gullah cook is conditioned to not cook out of the box. Now I'm not talking the younger ones, but I'm talking my generation and that. Um, food should be cooked from scratch. That's not going to last long. Um, one cup of cornmeal, secretly two thirds cup of cornmeal and one third of jiffy mix, a half cup of all purpose flour, um, a tea tablespoon of baking powder, tablespoon of salt. Now be careful um, with the salt because salt to, today is different from salt was in my mother's day. So a lot of those old recipes are not um, written to accommodate the new versions of things like sugar and salt. So you just have to keep tasting. Two thirds cup of milk, and that's regular milk. Some people, the old kids used to use canned milk, but it's a little heavy and it kind of makes the dumplings heavy too. So one cup of cornmeal, you know the secret. Um, one half cup of all purpose flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, one tablespoon of salt, and two thirds cup of milk. Now you wanna make sure that your milk is warm because well, at least my mother said that. Um, when you put all your dry ingredients in a bowl and mix them together um, with a whisk, then you start adding the warm milk. Don't pour it all in one time because you are in control as to how the, the fabric of this dumpling is going to turn out. You don't want it soupy like pancake mix. You don't want it hard like cornbread muffins. Somewhere in between, you want to be able to scoop it out with a spoon and drop it pun top the greens right before um, they're done. You want them to finish together. Now you may have to add some water before you add your dumplings because it depends on how fast you cook your greens or how much water is in it. Um, you may have to add uh, some water just so that the dumplings will have something to kind of sit on top. So um, again, this recipe is online and it's also in the Ultimate Dollar Cookbook on page 84. So I wanted to share that dish because of how I found out how closely it related to Africa, that time when everything went back. Here you were here with a, a dish from a continent. And talking to my friends from the Caribbean, Brazil and those places, they make the dish too. What a wonderful connection. Um, all shut I really ain't sleep. Well, I've enjoyed talking to you about Gullah food. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to actually make the recipe for you. Um, but I think it's all fun for you doing it yourself. Um, you can contact me. My Gmail account is gullahglobal1. You can mail P.O. Box 1287, Conway, 
South Carolina, 29527. You can call me and definitely you can like us on Facebook at shop.ultimategoal.com. There's another part to the title that I gave for my talk today. All shut eye ain't sleep. And all goodbye ain't gone. I want to thank you um, for your interest and for taking a moment to listen to me. And I look forward to talking more about food culture and how it all came to be and how it is today. All goodbye ain't gone. Thank you.